Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It's July 29th, 2015, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, as the Senate moves to defund Planned Parenthood, sponsors scramble to disassociate themselves from the abortionist. As gruesome videos exposing the organization's involvement in fetal organ harvesting continue to emerge. Then, a new shocking video emerges of a police officer in Idaho who is caught on camera smashing his elbow into a man's head. And agent provocateurs are back in action and working for the FBI. As another purported threat from ISIS inspired by social media is not only drastically overblown, but largely created by the government. All that plus much more coming up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Later on in our show, we'll have a special report from Paul Joseph Watson over in England. He's talking about the banking crisis. But first, let's talk about the crisis here at home, Planned Parenthood. So many videos are out right now, and we're, we have the understanding that more videos will be released in the very near future. But first, let's talk about as Senate moves to defund Planned Parenthood, sponsors scramble to disassociate from the abortionist. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has appointed Senator Joni Ernst to head up a group who will have the responsibility to craft a measure to deal with these horrendous videos. Ernst has previously been targeted by Planned Parenthood, which conducted a $500,000 smear campaign last year during the midterm election. So needless to say, they don't like her very much, but I'm sure the feeling is very mutual. But as we talk about these sponsors leaving, many big sponsors, including Coca-Cola, have left Planned Parenthood. So regardless of how you feel about Planned Parenthood, what you think about pro-choice versus pro-life, this is a proof positive example of pe people affecting change within their own ways. You know, somebody just takes a video camera, they go interview some of these high ranking officials in Planned Parenthood and look where we are. We have a national conversation, a national dialogue about what's going on inside of these facilities. And as far as I'm concerned, it couldn't have happened at a better time. And as we're talking about what's going on at these facilities, a couple months ago, we had a chance to go to a facility right here in Austin where somebody had previously a, uh, I guess you would call them a pro-abortionist, threw a Molotov cocktail at a prayer group who was out on the sidewalk. You know, afterwards, we had our own rally outside demanding the uh, pro-life rights of the children inside of those facilities. It's somewhat of a Black Lives Matter type deal, but it's really all lives matter. That's just the popular hashtag that's out right now. And now we have an Ohio state representative saying Black Lives Matter activists should protest Planned Parenthood. And this is Representative Bill Patman. He spoke during a rally at the Ohio State House on Tuesday after he co-sponsored new legislation that would cut off all state funding to Planned Parenthood in the wake of the video footage. And of course, this is all the footage that we've seen recently. People talking about how they want to go buy Lamborghinis and all these horrific things they do to the babies how much the livers are worth, how they try to get the forceps to take these things out cleanly, the brain, whatever other tissue they may have. And it's also interesting to note that there's a poll in the article that says about 63% of Americans oppose defunding Planned Parenthood, although the survey was conducted by Planned Parenthood itself. So, <laughs> yeah, we nobody wants to defund Planned Parenthood. They're just walking around asking people in the facilities, I guess, and Maybe there's a person or two who didn't quite understand the question and they voted against it. But people here in the state of Texas actually know what's going on. It's been a big fight with Planned Parenthood over the past, I guess, uh, several years here when they've been shutting down many of the abortion clinics here in the state. And then when you go out to these facilities, to these rallies, people show up chanting, hell, Satan, sticking their tongues out, devil worshiping communists, crawling over trash cans. And I know it's sensational, but it did happen. And now we have this report, Texas lawmaker, Planned Parenthood's culture of death is no different than Nazi Germany. And to find out that this culture of death is now leading to the sale, this is no different than what happened in Nazi Germany, said Representative Jody Londenberg, a Parker Republican, who is leading the anti-abortion lawmaker, this rally that was going on out there for the Texas Alliance of Life. And it goes on to say that this is no different than experimenting on old men and women like they were doing in Nazi Germany. So this is going on here and also today, right here in the state of Texas, they had a Senate committee panel and this was with Miss Abby Johnson. She was somebody who was on the show yesterday with David Knight talking about how she used to work in these abortion clinics and now she is a pro-life activist going against Planned Parenthood. 
after the abortion is performed, the fetal tissue, the aborted child, is suctioned into a glass container. That glass container goes into a lab called the POC lab, the POC lab. That officially stands for Products of Conception. Uh, however, in Planned Parenthood, the joke was that it stood for pieces of children. In 1990, Chad Trawick, a man from the Houston area, was walking around an abortion clinic in Houston. He saw buckets at the back door. He wondered why they would have buckets at the back door. He went over and picked up a baby boy, and there were slits in his back where his kidneys had been removed. This is not new. This has been going on a long time. The difference is now the truth is coming out, and we know that they're doing it and have been doing it in Texas for a long time. Dr. Martin Haskell from Ohio developed a technique to harvest organs, and because the head is the largest part and right. doesn't fall out, he would turn the baby over on its back, and he's the one that taught people to go through the back and harvest the organs while the baby was alive, a live blood supply, and then, of course, collapse the head. So there are different techniques that would be more dangerous Essentially to Essentially a partial birth abortion Yes, technique. sir. During sessions, some members of the legislature were incensed that some of our colleagues were videotaped secretly. And there were calls for investigations and many, many people were irate. Is any one of you bothered by the way that this videotaping took place? Uh, one of the reasons I left the abortion industry is they did an expose on my clinics. They sent three reporters to the doctor to be certain they weren't pregnant at a news station, the CBS affiliate in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Sent three reporters to the doctor to be certain they weren't pregnant, then sent them in our abortion clinic to see if we would attempt to abort them even though they clearly were not pregnant. They caught us doing so, and that was one of the catalysts for my walking out of the abortion clinic. So it works. I mean, it happens all the time, sadly. Now, with the statements that Donald Trump has recently made, more and more people are talking about the border. What's going on down there? What type of security do we have or lack thereof? Of course, our crew goes down there. They see guys with satchels going across the border, throwing these big satchels into this truck and driving off. Who knows what was in those packages, but I'm pretty sure if they do it like that, it may be some illicit activity. And now we're not just talking about things that are coming over the border, but also the people. Now, let me be very clear. I think most of the people who want to come to this country are good, well-meaning people, whether they're from Central America, South America. They have issues of poverty, of health, of crime in their neighborhoods, and they just want to escape that. And that's the point I'm trying to make, but there are also the criminal element that do accompany these people here. Now, are all the people coming over the border criminals? Absolutely not. But are there some people? Absolutely, yes. And now we have this article, MS-13, Violent Street Gangs Recruiting Newly Arrived Illegal Youth. And this is some action that's going on in the upper states, but also happens down here in Texas as well. The gangs, which also include the Latin Kings, are targeting immigrant communities in New York and elsewhere across the country for recruits under the age of 18. Many of these children were, in fact, previously apprehended by immigration authorities, but as InfoWars discovered last year, the federal government has quickly released them and even buying them bus tickets to resettle anywhere in the United States. And also we see the reports in various states of MS-13 members coming to the states and how they got through uh, immigration customs, ICE, I'm not exactly sure, but these guys are all tatted up, they have tattoos. Once again, this isn't everybody coming over the border, but this, they definitely do have the criminal element that does accompany them. And as we're talking about the people getting the bus vouchers, as myself and the crew last year, we go down to South Texas and I had a chance to speak to a gentleman named Pagan in McAllen, Texas. He is one of the city representatives. And we're having this conversation. He's like, yeah, they're buying them bus tickets to ship them you know, elsewhere in the country. I was like, who's buying them bus tickets? He's like the Border Patrol, or thus was his understanding. So which is to say you have these people, they give them a voucher, you know, your court dates, I think the average court date's, what, three years away. So then they give them a bus ticket to hop on a Greyhound and go pretty much any place in the U.S. Do you really think somebody who went all the way up to Washington State is going to drive all the way back down to the state of Texas three years later just to get deported? I think absolutely not. And once again, if you want to come to the country, there's a legal, lawful way. You can be naturalized, and people say that's unrealistic, that's unreliable. Well, I talked to a young lady when we went out to California last year. I believe she was from Singapore. We got this on video. And she was telling me, yeah, it is a very long process, expensive process, but she did it the legal, lawful way. But she is now a United States citizen, and I am very happy to have her here because she did it the proper way. Now, let's talk about people who aren't doing things the proper way. There's all type of police brutality going on. We know this is happening, has been happening. We just see it more prevalent because of the advent of camera phones and so forth. 
So I'm going to show you this video. Pocatello police detective Steve Westfall was captured on dash cam, forcefully pressing his forearm into James Rutherford's head. So you can judge for yourself whether or not that was necessary, but we have to show these videos and put these videos out in light. And it's not to demonize the police. There are plenty of good police officers out there helping kids cross the street and getting cats out of trees that don't get national attention. But when these guys so often do these actions, nothing happens to them. Case in point, Kelly Thomas or Eric Garner, these guys commit these horrendous crimes on video, nothing happens. But then again, there are plenty of good police out there. And for that, I'll let you judge this one for yourself. This is a University of Cincinnati officer who has been indicted in the fatal shooting of Samuel DeBose. What did you pull me over for? Again, the front tag. But it's not illegal to have a front tag. Okay. Actually, it is. I'm going to ask you again. Do you have a license on you? I have a license. You can run my name. Okay. Is that not on you then? Uh, I don't think I have it on me. Be straight up with me. Are you suspended? No, I'm not suspended. Go ahead and take your seatbelt off for me. I ain't even doing that. Go ahead and take your seatbelt off. Stop! Stop! And we'll settle in for this segment with this. Obama judge finds school over Christian prayer. So basically this is a situation in Mississippi. They invited a gentleman, Reverend Rob Gill, to come in and speak to the students. But they said, hey, this, you can't have this guy in here talking about religion in the schools. And now the school has been fined seven or excuse me, seven thousand five hundred dollars. And they're also threatening to sue the school for more money if this type of thing is repeated. And that's recording according to the Christian Post. And we'll settle to a close with this. Obama judge finds school over Christian prayer. And this is in Rankin, Mississippi. Basically, a reverend was invited to come speak at a school assembly, and they said, we can't have this guy coming in and closing things down with a prayer. So basically, a student has fined the school with their attorney $7,500, according to the Christian Post, and it also says they will come after them again if they choose to have another person come and speak a prayer. So this is the war on religion. You can have all these other things people can talk about. Islam, they can uh, stomp on the name of Jesus in schools, but if you dare talk about Christianity, that's a big foul. Now, John Bound has a report talking about how they have erected a statue of Satan someplace else, but that's perfectly fine, but you can't have the Ten Commandments. Stay tuned for more reports after this break. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. She says, I'm rebellious. Hail Satan. Well, don't worry. You're going to have judgment. The country's going to collapse. 53 million dead children. Everybody wants to say they're not human. The New World Order is going to say you're not human. The New World Order is going to take everything you've got. And when you beg for help, when you beg for mercy, no one's going to come. I mean, I just turned on the TV. Wait till you see this. Look, look just watch. Oh, look at this. I have no idea what that means. Yeah, I have no idea what that means. Me neither. A group from New York's Satanic Temple made the trip to Meridian to protest the Westboro Baptist Church. You can see from pictures on their website there they performed a ritual they call Pink Mass on the grave of Katherine Johnston, the mother of Westboro founder Fred Phelps Jr. The ceremony involved two same-sex couples kissing over her grave. They then declared Katherine Johnston a lesbian in the afterlife. It is an unusual crime. Not only does it violate a state and city ordinance, but it also violates the moral decency of a human being. The Detroit Satanic Temple has unveiled its one-ton monument of Baphomet replete with two children glaring up at its goat-headed insolence. The nine-foot-tall $100,000-plus monument was slated to be unveiled at the Oklahoma State Capitol as a legal protest of separation of church and state. The Oklahoma State Capitol had been recently adorned with a Ten Commandments monument. However, a person hearing voices crashed into the Ten Commandments monument, causing a halt to the nefarious intention of the Satanic Temple. Satanic Temple spokesperson Lucian Greaves declared that the Baphomet statue would not be erected until the Ten Commandments statue statue is restored. It's really encouraging. It's, it's really moving. And we do get a lot of messages that uh, start out with the caveat, you know, I am a Christian, however, and they explain they appreciate what we're doing. But many say the statue goes against core Oklahoman beliefs. Of having little kids around it, uh, that's just ridiculous. I mean, I don't, I don't understand where they come from. Our whole judicial system is based on the Ten Commandments. Whether whether you like it or not, it's our judicial system. We have to let this play out however it plays out, but we'll, we'll keep pushing 
to make sure that it's going ahead. Over the weekend, the Satanic Temple of Detroit held an unveiling event of the Baphomet statue that promised a night of noise, chaos, and debauchery. The location was not to be revealed until $25 ticket goers were informed of the location. VIP ticket holders would be given the opportunity to sit in the statue's lap for pictures. On Saturday night, the location was revealed to be on Joseph Campau Avenue, one of the oldest areas in Detroit. But the temple doesn't intend on the statue remaining in Detroit. They are still intent on it being put up in Oklahoma, or in the words of Greaves, other battlegrounds in other states with plans to erect a Ten Commandments or similar monument. Separation of church and state is one thing. Allowing the tenets of the liberty destroying New World Order to thrive is quite another. Opening the door for this Illuminati parade of anti-morality and anti-ethical standards to be infused into common civics will most certainly accelerate a downward spiral. The spiral we are all experiencing as the architects of the New World Order close in on their endgame. We are now facing a common challenge. And the challenge is how to build a world order for the first time in history on a global basis. Our goal will be accomplished one drop at a time. John Bound for Infowars.com. The FBI has foiled about 17 plots to kill Americans during the past 10 years. What it will not tell you is that there have been 20 foiled plots, and of them, three were interrupted by members of the public. The 17 that were interrupted by the feds were created by the feds. I think Judge Napolitano said it best when he said many of the terrorist actions stopped by the feds have been created by the feds or something to that effect. And now we have this article from Kurt Nimmo today. FBI fabricates ISIS terror case from scratch. And the case of Harlem Suarez, age 23, of Key West, reveals a pur purported threat of ISIS in a supposed cadre of lone wolves inspired by social media is not only dramatically overblown, but largely created by the government. On Tuesday, federal officials said Suarez was arrested for planning to set off a backpack bomb at a beach in Florida where he was inspired by ISIS. The entire case was manufactured by the FBI. The agency gave Suarez a dummy bomb after he made remarks on Facebook about ISIS. A source cooperating with the FBI was then sent to help Suarez make a video urging Muslim brothers to buy AKs, knives, and machetes and fight, according to NBC News. So if you think that this is just some overblown deal that the government never does these things, and then of course there are many good men and women in the FBI, the CIA, any other alphabet agency who have nothing to do with these things, but whether it's uh, having these guys build bombs or bringing uh, cocaine into the country with the CIA, these things do happen. So we have to be aware of them and pretty much call them out when these things happen. And for more on this, we have a throwback report from The Vault detailing why are so many people in these false flag operations connected to the government? Why are they government informants? How does this happen and continue to happen in the United States of America? An often overlooked link that ties many domestic terror suspects together is their relationship with federal authorities. Case in point, the recent shooter in Kansas. It's been reported that Fraser Glenn Cross, originally Fraser Glenn Miller, became a federal flunky to reduce his jail time for KKK activities years ago. Upon his release from jail, reports claim Cross became a paid informant until the shootings in Overland Park, Kansas, where he targeted the Jewish community. From shootings to bombings, lawyers for alleged Boston bomber Johar Zarnayev say that the FBI had numerous contacts with their client's older brother, Tamerlan. This fits in with the mother of the Zarnayev brothers stating that the FBI contacted Tamerlan after the bombings and before he was listed as a suspect. Not to mention Tamerlan attending CIA-sponsored workshops and the DHS and FBI being briefed to Tamerlan's activities well before the bombing in Boston. But sometimes feds need their informants active on the digital plane. Court documents show that Hector Monsinger, the FBI informant who ratted out hackers from the group's LulzSec and Anonymous, directed hundreds of cyber attacks against the government websites of Iran, Syria, Pakistan, Brazil, and others. And if you're convinced that all of the prior are simply isolated incidents, watch this. If you ask the leadership of the FBI, most of whose field agents are tireless, dedicated, constitution-supporting professionals, it will tell you that it, the FBI, has foiled about 17 plots to kill Americans during the past 10 years. 
What it will not tell you is that there have been 20 foiled plots, and of them, three were interrupted by members of the public. The 17 that were interrupted by the feds were created by the feds. One of the incidents Judge Napolitano goes on to point out is the underwear bomber. InfoWars talked with eyewitness Kurt Haskell about what he saw on the underwear bomber flight. In January 2010, we had hearings in Congress on this where we had Under Secretary of State Patrick Kennedy come out. And if you watch the video of him, it's pretty telling that he's trying to uh, cover up something and not tell the truth. He's squirming in his chair and seems really uncomfortable answering the questions. And this video is all over the Internet if you want to Google it and look at it. But what he said is basically, you know, we knew Abdul Mutalab was a terrorist. We wanted to stop him from coming in the country and revoke his visa. There have been numerous cases where our unilateral and uncoordinated revocation of the visa would have disrupted important investigations that were underway by one of our national security partners. They had the individual under investigation and our revocation action would have disclosed U.S. government's interest in that individual and ended our colleagues' ability, such as the FBI, to pursue the case quietly and to identify terrorist plans and co-conspirators. But we had a request from an intelligence agency, and he didn't say which one. What he said was, we'll talk about it in closed session. And he said, we had a request from an intelligence agency that they're tracking Abdul Mutalab. They, uh, they want to let him into the U.S. to follow him and to catch bigger fish and they honor that request in order to let whatever intelligence agency do their business so that they wouldn't knock out one lone soldier in the war on terror and they could essentially follow him in the U.S. and catch accomplices. So that's what they admitted to. But Patrick Kennedy went on to say there's more to this we need to talk about in closed session and that's kind of where it ended. So uh, obviously I don't believe that for a minute. Uh, what uh, I believe through and what's been shown through the evidence, I believe, is that an intelligence agency gave Abdul Mutalab an intentionally defective bomb and put him on the plane to stage a fake terrorist attack. And we'll end looking at the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Last winter, the FBI was praised for its speed in cracking the case of the World Trade Center bombing and bringing four suspects to trial. Now, there is some evidence that the FBI may have known of the plot in advance through an informant and might, might even have stopped the bombing that killed six people. FBI agents might have been able to prevent last February's deadly explosion at New York's World Trade Center. They discussed secretly substituting harmless powder for the explosives, but they didn't, according to the FBI's own informant, Imad Salem. Unbeknownst to the FBI at the time, Salem recorded many of his conversations with his handlers. You got paid regularly for, for good information. Uh, if that's what you think, guys, is fine. But I don't think that because we was start already building the bomb, which is went off in the World Trade Center. Uh, it was built by uh, 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 supervising uh, supervision from the bureau and the GA, and we was all informed about it, and we know that the bomb start to be built. By who? By your confidential informant. What a wonderful, great case. Did you hear that? The informant claims he built the bomb under the direction of the FBI. You can find more reports at InfoWars.com. Is this global governance at last? Is it one world, the central bankers in charge? Aren't we all just living and dying for what the central banks do? Aren't we all just... That's so typical of the way the IMF and the World Bank work. They just put a country in debt, and it's such a big debt it can't pay it, and then you offer to refinance that debt. Greek voters will be asked to rule on two draft documents that detail a proposal by the country's creditors to unlock aid as much as 15.5 billion euros for Greece in return for sales tax increases and pension reforms. And the plan has failed. This isn't just Greece we're talking about today. The whole of the Mediterranean now finds itself in the wrong currency. But the big banks, the big businesses and big politics forced you in. Goldman Sachs, the German arms manufacturers, they were all very happy. And when the bailouts began, they weren't for the Greek people. Those bailouts were to bail out French, 
German and Italian banks. They haven't helped you. The governments don't rule the world. Goldman Sachs rules the world. It's Paul Joseph Watson reporting for Infowars.com outside the Bank of England in London. And on the subject of banks, of course, we had HSBC slapped with fines recently for money laundering, whereas when it comes to the customer of a bank, we're being treated with more and more suspicion. Of course, major cash withdrawals are now being treated suspiciously. We've also got Halifax Bank today in an article on Infowars.com where they're giving information to third parties about when and where people visit banks. So the exact time, location, when people are visiting banks, withdrawing money, they're putting this in a database and passing it over to third parties. No idea if that information remains secure. We approached Halifax Bank and the third party involved in this, and they basically acknowledged that that was the case. They're taking the exact time and location when you visit the bank and then calling you up saying, oh, Mr. Smith, we know that you were at the bank last Friday. Uh, we want to talk to you about the services we can offer. So they're actually keeping that information, your physical location as you go from bank to bank in a central database and then selling it to third parties who will then call you up and harass you. And remember, they do this under the guise of customer service. They're just helping you by knowing and tracking the location where you visit your bank, how much money you take out. Uh, again, going into the bank, taking out amounts as small as £5,000 is being treated as suspicious activity. You're having to provide documents to prove not only why you're taking out the money, but also where it will go with documentation to prove that. Feds urge banks to call cops on customers who withdraw $5,000 or more. When I take a crew of five or six reporters to Europe, I give them all $2,000 and they give me receipts, but in case the cards quit working, which happens all the time, we've got money. That's not, if we're carrying $10,000 cash on us, we're not criminals. Cash isn't illegal. This whole phony drug war, the banks launder the drug money publicly, and then they act like we're criminal taking company money or after-tax money out of the bank. So again, the stranglehold is being tightened on the ordinary customer for banks, whereas big banks that commit major fraud are getting away with slaps on the wrist and it continues to happen. We're coming under increasing scrutiny simply for withdrawing large amounts of cash or visiting the ATM to take out money. So that's how serious it's become. This is Paul Joseph Watson reporting live from the Bank of England for Infowars.com. This is Paul Joseph Watson reporting for Infowars.com. Amazing, shocking story up on Infowars.com today, which centers around this right-wing leader called Tommy Robinson. He's quite controversial in this country. He was arrested, re-arrested recently for planning to attend a Draw Mohammed cartoon contest. Now, to understand the backstory, he was arrested separately for mortgage fraud last year, but he was already released by police in June. They re-arrested him literally days before this event was due to take place last week because of the fear that he might offend Muslims. Now, this is coming out of a left-wing group called Hope Not Hate, which said that these right-wing individuals were planning to disseminate Mohammed cartoons in Muslim areas to, to start, quote, a civil war. That was completely unfounded, but Robinson himself has confirmed that he was re-arrested by police just for planning to attend this Draw Mohammed cartoon event here in the United Kingdom. His speech in Oxford last year was also cancelled because, again, he was arrested by police. So we literally have four criminals being kidnapped on the streets of London for daring to even think about committing the thought crime of offending Muslims. Of course, you think back to Charlie Hebdo back in January, Just We Charlie and that whole stand for free speech, that has also completely evaporated in light of Charlie Hebdo now backing down and saying they will stop drawing Mohammed cartoons. 
Now contrast this to an incident which occurred right here in London in this very area just a few weeks ago where a Muslim individual was walking around waving an ISIS flag. He was briefly detained by police, not taken in for questioning, not arrested for carrying an ISIS flag on the streets of London. Meanwhile, British nationals who merely dare to plan to attend a Draw Mohammed cartoon event are being kidnapped off the streets simply for their free speech. We also had another incident here in the United Kingdom about a year ago where a political leader of the Liberty Party called Paul Weston was arrested again on the street for daring to read out a Winston Churchill quote about immigration because it could cause offence to immigrants. So we literally have thought criminals, political dissidents, being arrested on the streets of London because they might offend Muslims. That's the shocking state of free speech here in London in the United Kingdom. I'm going to have more updates on that story on Infowars.com. This is Paul Joseph Watson reporting live from London for Infowars.com. Today on the Alex Jones Show, David Knight talked about a very controversial topic that the killing of Cecil the Lion. And while it is very sad that they raise these somewhat domesticated lions and then have people go and shoot them, you know, it's very unfortunate. It's kind of like shooting a dog here and then they celebrate, yeah, I shot the lion. As sad as that is, there are other things that affect Americans more directly than the shooting of this animal. I want to take a look at the media frenzy around Cecil the black maned lion. There are a raft of reports, and of course, Drudge always has his thumb on the zeitgeist of the media. Uh, you can see a ton of these reports up at the uh, linked at the top of the Drudge report. Here's some of the headlines. Jimmy Kimmel chokes up on air over Cecil the lion. He likens the hunter who killed him to Bill Cosby. Zimbabwean officials say an American man is wanted in the killing of Cecil the lion. The Daily Mail says the hunter hunted. An American dentist who paid $55,000 to kill off Africa's most famous lion goes into hiding and says he did nothing wrong as Zimbabwe police demand to speak to him. A coward and a killer, they say. Protesters target his office, his surgery office, after he admits to doing this. So we see these headlines everywhere. I want to play you a little bit of a clip that was on CNN. Let's play uh, that first clip, guys. It's uh, alleged that uh, Walter Palman, this dentist from Minnesota, was in Zimbabwe on the border regions of this park and that him and the guides lured or baited this line, this iconic line, Cecil, from Huanga National Park out of the park. So you hear that? They lured or baited him. Does that sound familiar? We just had Abby Hoffman on yesterday talking about the practices in Planned Parenthood where she was a manager uh, an employee of the year before she resigned. She was concerned that people were being lured and baited. Women were being lured and baited in there on the promise of family planning, but they were given quotas, quotas to sell abortions. That's a different kind of bait and switch, isn't it? But we can't get that upset about human babies. We can save the baby whales, but we can't save the baby humans. And there's this massive media frenzy about Cecil the Lion. One more clip, let's play that next clip. He shot him with a crossbow, but that crossbow didn't kill the lion outright. They tracked, according to conservation officials, that lion for 40 hours and then killed it with a weapon of some kind. And then uh, they severed the head as a trophy. There you go. Concern about, and rightful concern, I would say. I'm not, I'm not trashing the fact that people are concerned that this was perhaps done illegally that the animal suffered a great deal of time. I don't have the problem with hunting that a lot of people do. I think that's a perfectly legitimate thing. But, of course, a lot of people want to stop all hunting. Nevertheless, understand that they say, well, he shot him. It took a very long time for him to die, so he's suffering. That was what, that's what Abby Johnson said yesterday. First of all, there were two things, the quotas that disturbed her, and then the final thing that caused her to resign immediately was when she saw an ultrasound of a fetus recoiling in pain from the procedure. The babies are ripped apart, and we don't have any concern about that, but we're concerned that it took extra time for this lion to die. And then they took his head as a trophy. What is Planned Parenthood doing with the babies that they kill? That's precisely the point in these videos that we see over and over again. Here's an article from Infowars.com. 
Planned Parenthood demands that the media not air damning footage. This came out yesterday from Don Salazar here at Infowars.com. The material they say should not be aired. They're telling local news outlets. Let me read to you a, a long interview that's on Salon with Camille Pagli. And again, yesterday she had uh, uh, some very good candid remarks. She's a straight shooter. I don't, dis I don't agree with her on a lot of things, but she is very straight up with what she has to say. We read her comments yesterday about Hillary Clinton. This is what she says about the media, of course. She's talking about how controlled the media was. She said, the rise of Rush Limbaugh on conservative talk radio came about precisely because of the lockdown of a very small clique of people on the media that had a liberal bias. But she said she was a liberal and she couldn't get access in that media. They completely shut her out. And she said, let me give you a recent example of the persistent insularity of the liberal thought in the media. She said when the first secret Planned Parenthood video was released in mid-July, anyone who looks only at liberal media was kept totally in the dark about it. Even the second video, when it was released, same thing happened. But the videos were being run nonstop all over conservative talk radio uh, shows and on television. It was a huge and disturbing story, but there was total silence in the liberal media, yes. What they are demanding today from local media outlets, trying to intimidate them. She says, this is Camille Pagli again, a liberal feminist. She said that kind of censorship was shockingly unprofessional. The liberal major media were trying to bury the story by ignoring it. Now they're demanding that people ignore it, and I'll, I'll add. Going back to her, she says, I am a former member of Planned Parenthood and a strong supporter of unconstrained reproductive rights. But I was horrified and disgusted by those videos and immediately felt there were serious breaches of medical ethics in the conduct of Planned Parenthood officials. Here's my point. It is everyone's obligation, whatever your political views, to look at both liberal and conservative news sources every single day. You need a full range of viewpoints to understand what's going on in this world. Absolutely right. Again, she is strongly supporting abortion. She sees it as reproductive rights. I strongly disagree. I see it as killing innocent human life. But we both agree that you need to look at a broad spectrum of media, form your own opinions, go to people who will honestly tell you what they think. Look, this whole nonsense about journalism being disinterested and being honest, anybody that is selling you that is selling you a lie. Either they're stupid enough that they don't recognize their own biases or they're being dishonest with you about their own biases, okay? Even what they report, which is what she's talking about here, even what they choose to report is influenced by their own personal opinions. So there is no objective media. There is media out there that will tell you what they think. We're part of that media. We will tell you what we think. You may disagree with us, we'll make our best case for it, but we are not gonna tell you that we're sitting here disinterested, sitting in the middle, well, on this hand we have this, and on this hand we have that. Yeah, we'll give you both sides of it, and then we'll, we'll form an opinion, tell you what we think, help you to form your opinion. There is no disinterested media. Anybody that tells you that is an idiot or they're lying. Now, in terms of the other things that came out of that interview yesterday with Abby, Johnson, and again, her website is abortionworker.com. We had an article that went up yesterday evening uh, highlighting one of the things that she told us, which I was absolutely amazed to find out, that Planned Parenthood here in Austin has a $1 a year lease on a 7,000-square-foot facility that they're performing their abortions at. They have a $1 a year lease from our city. Our city of Austin is subsidizing that facility. They have a 20-year lease. One dollar a year. And so we put that article up because you may not be aware that that is happening in your area. Here's an article from WND. Women are betrayed. There are protests in 65 U.S. cities across the United States. An estimated 12,000 Americans in as many as 65 U.S. cities took to the streets on Tuesday to demand an end to federal funding of Planned Parenthood. Do not make me pay for this. I find the practice abhorrent. It is a violation of my religious beliefs. Do not force me to pay for this. Something this controversial, if it is even going to exist, we can have this discussion, should not be funded by the federal government. It should not be funded by taxes. And so these people are 
are demanding an end to federal funding of Planned Parenthood, but maybe you don't understand that there's probably state and city and local subsidies of Planned Parenthood. So you need to investigate that. I was not aware of that here in uh, Austin as well. And again, one more article that's uh, up on Infowars.com came out today. As Senate moves to defund Planned Parenthood, sponsors are scrambling to disassociate themselves from these abortionists. They say they everybody is demanding to be taken off of that. They don't want to be associated with that. It's not to say they won't still give them the money. They'll find some way to do it. And that's it for our show tonight. Be sure